time to open the service with prayer this evening. We've got several requests that have been given in. First, let's, uh, we've got a praise report for Haley. She's passed her uh, driver's, uh, what was it? Her, uh, so she's ready to drive now. So let's all pray even harder now. Uh, yeah. Um, we, we've had several requests given in. Um, Brother Charlie's going to stand in for Brother Zach this evening for his arm. Um, Lois isn't feeling well. We need to remember her in prayer. Um, remember uh, Dr. Killian's family. Um, Sister Shelton's co-worker, Lisa, her mom needs prayer. Um, Jimmy Barnes uh, has a request given in for prayer. And Sister Andrea's asthma needs to be remembered because she's having a hard time because of the weather. I think that this weather's giving everybody a hard time. Does anyone else have any spoken requests? Sister Sharon. Mm. This is a time we need to be drawing closer instead of drifting away. Right. Yes, sir. We can see the signs all around us. That Jesus comes right at the door. Any others? All right, Brother Charlie's going to stand in for Brother Zach. Let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer. We got a lot of requests tonight, but God's heard every one of them. We need to yes. move on them. Father, we thank, thank you. you. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. to be back in the house of the Lord again this evening. Yes. Uh, you know, it was only six hours ago that we were up here worshiping God, and I don't think anything's changed to stop us from worshiping Him now. Right. You know, uh, yes, sir. 
we've still got our restrictions on us, but nobody was more restricted than Paul and Silas was when they was at Philippi. You know, if they can praise God and cause an earthquake to break everyone's chains off of them, we can do the same here this evening. But, uh, we're going to worship him this evening in spirit and truth. Let's worship him and give him first. Uh, if we ask our ushers to come this evening. Praise God. Hallelujah. I feel the same Holy Ghost here tonight that was here this morning. Praise God. My God. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Brother Matthew, if you will, ask the Lord bless this time of giving. not hold back from the Lord this season. Let's worship him with the praise and worship team tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Y'all can stand with us if you're comfortable in standing. Let's sing unto the Lord.
if he abides with you, you got a reason to praise and worship him. And he's better than anything in this world. If, you, if he's not everything to you, you've got nothing at all. This time I'm going to hand serve, serve, Pastor Brother Shelton. How many here know the Lord abides with us? I'm glad I'm not depending on the Republicans or the Democrats. I'm glad I'm not depending on that White House. I'm praying for this next election, certainly, and I'm going to vote, Lord willing. But I'm not depending on that. And I'm glad that we have the Holy Ghost and He has us. We have the Lord living on the inside of us. He abides with us. And we abide with Him. I'm telling you, there's no safer place on this earth to be in Him and Him in us. Can you say amen? amen? It's good to be back in the house of God tonight. Appreciate, enjoyed that good service this morning. Enjoyed the good spirit of the Lord. I felt such a liberty, such a freedom. And that's how it ought to be in the house of God. It ought to be free in the house of the Lord. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And we ought to be able to take that liberty in God and come to God's house with a spirit of expectation. <clears throat> Not just hearing a song or two, hearing some preaching and going home. But come expecting for God to do something mighty. For God to do something wonderful in our midst. I believe that's His desire. I believe God wants to show Himself mightily to His children. Amen. And I believe if we'll just get in this thing together, the Bible says on the day of Pentecost, they were in one place, in one mind, and in one accord. I believe if there had been division and fussing and fighting, carrying on, the Holy Ghost would have never been poured out upon them. The Bible said to Peter and John in Acts chapter 3 on the way to the temple, they went there together. And a, and a lame man got healed. They were together on that day of Pentecost, and heaven come down. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, we can get that kind of frame of mind, that kind of heart united. We'll see God do something wonderful in the midst of his church. Amen. We're glad you're here. want to get into the word of God. Scott, thank you, son. Brother Scott did a great job tonight. <clears throat> I appreciate him, family, all of you. Let's stand James chapter 4 tonight. <clears throat> I love preacher friend of mine, of mine we and I were talking about this book and he said you know it's one of my very favorite in the Bible if you hadn't read it lately I'd challenge you to go back and just read the whole book again James chapter 4 very familiar scripture tonight but I, I certainly believe it is it is befitting of where we are in this time James chapter 4 verse 4 glad to have Sistina back tonight Let's keep praying for Brother Zach that God will help him just to heal. I told her before service that uh, I've always believed that Brother Zach w was one that had a high tolerance for pain. And so for him to be in the pain he's in, it's got to be severe. But I know God can touch him and help him, and I know God's going to. I know they're thankful for all your prayers. You keep praying for him and uh, keep praying for her. She's having to, she told me the other day <clears throat> after he had surgery, I hate it. You can't go in there and be with them now. And I like to have prayer with somebody before they have surgery, and you can't go in there. And uh, I told her, she was talking about how, what he was going through and the pain he'd been in, and uh, I just sent the words to her, in sickness and in health. That's what we vowed to, in sickness and in health. We like the in health part, but it's that in sickness we have a problem with. But uh, he's been really sick, and uh, I just know God's going to help him. Amen. James chapter 4, reading verse 4, and help her too. She's having to take care of him. And sisters, you know how that is when men get sick. Oh, dear God. That right? It's the end of the world, isn't it? <laughs> James chapter 4, verse 4. Bible said, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Now, could you imagine if James stood in our pulpits today and said that? They'd have him at the state office. They'd take a vote before the service is over and have him voted out as the pastor of that church. But he said it flat-footed. He said, ye adulterers and adulteresses. He's not preaching the bar room. He's not preaching outside the drug den. He's talking to the church, believers here. Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, 
is the enemy of God. Now, I don't know what that does to you. When I read that, boy, it caused me to want to pull my brute straps up tight. He said, if you're a friend of this world, you are an enemy of God. I, you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to do anything to be an enemy with God. I don't mind if the devil's mad at me. I don't mind if family gets mad at me. I don't mind if neighbors get mad at me. I don't care if the Democrat Party and the Republican Party don't like me. But I don't want to be an enemy of God. Can you say amen tonight? He said if you're a friend of this world, then you are an enemy of God. May the Lord add his blessings to his red word tonight. Got a lot of preaching and short time to do it in. I want to talk to you tonight about a problem that has always been. It was a problem in the Old Testament. It was a problem in the New Testament. And it's certainly a problem today that's getting worse and worse and worse. That is the problem of worldliness. Worldliness is killing our churches. COVID-19 is not killing our churches. Worldliness is killing our churches. I believe I'll say that again. It's not COVID-19 that's killing the church today. It is worldliness that is killing the church today. It's all right. Go ahead. If you take notes when I preach, write that down, please. Worldliness is killing our churches. Worldliness is killing our pulpits spiritually. I believe that worldliness is the greatest problem among the church today. While our leaders look the other way, I said while our leaders look the other way, and while pastors applaud what they call progress, while church members become more and more worldly, our churches are dying spiritually. I read where that Israel was growing, but yet the ark was gone. They named that child Ichabod. There's growth there. There's life there. There's another member there. But they named that child Ichabod, which means the glory has departed. Church growth is not always real growth. I got a lot of preaching to do tonight. Members have become twice dead and plucked up by the roots because of worldliness. Churches that used to be on fire for God used to be strong in the Lord. Now they have become a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. But yet they all say, what a wonderful service we had. But they're dying because of worldliness. I want to preach to you tonight on that thought, the problem of worldliness. When you begin to read the book of James, and again, I want to encourage you to do that. Go through that book. Don't just read it hurriedly. Go through and study his writings. We find that, you know, it doesn't take long to realize that James was a fearless preacher. I like fearless preachers. My grandfather used to say, if you're going to serve the Lord, you've got to have a backbone like a cross tie. And I believe the same is true if you're going to be a preacher of righteousness and a preacher of the gospel. Uh, you've got to have some Holy Ghost in you. You, you've got to have some concrete in your spine. I love fearless preachers. Now, I believe that we need fearless preachers today like James was. Men who will get along with God and hear from God and then stand in that pulpit, uh, whether it's your own pulpit or somebody else's pulpit, uh, and declare, Thus saith the Lord. Now, I've heard it said down through the years. I, I'm going to try to be short here tonight, but I'm probably not going to be. I've heard it said down through the years. I've heard pastors say this and pastors' wives say this. I, you know, that evangelist didn't have any right to come in here and preach that. That evangelist didn't have a right to come in here and try to preach and pastor this church. Let me tell you something, Brother Josh. 
You're an evangelist. If God tells you to preach something, uh, then that door's open. You preach it. You may not get to go back again, uh, but you preach what the Lord says to you. I I've told pastors before, if I have an evangelist come to this church, uh, I want him to preach what God has said to him. I said, I want him to preach what the Word of God is, and I want him to say, this is what thus saith the Lord. We need men today who are not jockeying for position. Men who are not jockeying for titles. Men who are not afraid to stand for the Word of God regardless of who gets offended or regardless of who gets upset or who gets their little feelings hurt. We need men who refuse to soften the message just to please the masses. I heard a preacher say that, you know, there was a time, there was things that I would preach uh, from the pulpit uh, that had offended people and, you know, maybe run some people off. This is what he said. He said, I'm no longer going to preach those things uh, from the pulpit. Uh, I'm going to deal with those things behind closed doors because he didn't want to offend somebody. I, he didn't want to run somebody off. I, I thought to myself, God, help us. I said, God, help us when we start trying to put a muzzle uh, on the pulpit uh, and to put a mu muzzle uh, on the Word of God because we're afraid of offending somebody uh, or we're afraid of rubbing somebody the wrong way. We need fearless men of God in our pulpits again today. How many believe that's true? We find here that James is preaching the word of God to early believers, most likely those that were there in Jerusalem. And he deals with all of the major difficulties uh, and obstacles that keep Christians from behaving uh, the way Christians ought to behave. I believe that Christians ought to live like Christians. I believe the Bible said, Let everyone that nameth the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. And the word Christian means Christ-like. I believe if we're going to call ourselves Christians, uh, then we ought to behave like Christians, and we ought to live like Christians. Uh, we ought to live like Christ lived. Can you say amen? Here in verse 4 that I read to you tonight, we can find here that James is dealing with the problem of worldliness. And worldliness is a definite problem among the church today. He mentions the word world two times in verse 4. He said, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, this is what I want you to understand. When James is speaking here of the world, he's not talking about God's beautiful creation, this world of nature and the world of creation that we preached about this morning. When he talks about the world, he's not talking about this world of people here, but he's talking about the world as a system, organizing itself in opposition and in hostility unto God. He's talking about that system of society that seeks to pull us away from the Lord and our complete devotion unto Him. When you study the New Testament, you find that the believer has three primary enemies. That is the devil, the flesh, and the world. Somebody said, well, I've got three enemies here that I'm dealing with. I'm telling you, you're not alone here. We may, we may have three enemies, but we've also got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. I may battle the world, the flesh, and the devil, but I'm glad I've got the triune Godhead on my side. And the Bible said, if God be for us, who can be against us? We're fighting the flesh, we're fighting the devil, and we're fighting the world. The Bible makes it clear here that that world uh, is our enemy. John said in 1 John 2 and 15, Love not the world. Did you realize that's a lot of problem in the church today? Uh, we love the world too much. I said we love the world too much. I believe if we had loved the Lord more, we'd love the ways of that world a, a whole lot less. And we would see a lot greater things taking place among the church today. John said, love not the world. 
Again, he's not talking about people here, uh, but rather the system of the world uh, that is in opposition to God, uh, opposing God's word and God's holiness. He said, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, uh, the love of the Father is not in him. What he's saying here is this. Uh, we cannot be a lover of the world uh, and a lover of God at the same time. Somebody said, but I go to church. But if you love that world, you don't love God. Somebody said, but I sing in the choir. But if you love that world, you do not love God. They said, well, I'm a member at the local church. I'm part of the youth group. I play music in the church. But John said, if you love the world, then the love of the Father is not in you. We cannot have it both ways. We cannot court the world and court God at the same time we cannot serve God and live for ourselves at the same time I'm just telling you here tonight what we need is a revival of returning to our first love again that we'd fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and we'd lose our love for that old world out there somebody give him a hand of praise tonight hallelujah my, 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 my. I want to preach a little meat of the word to you here tonight. Jesus Christ settled what the relationship of every believer ought to be with this world in John chapter 17. In John 17, he sets forth four truths about our relationship with this world. First of all, if we know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we have been saved out of the world. Second of all, we are still in this world. Third, uh, we are not to be of this world. And fourth, we are sent into the world uh, to be a witness to this world uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. So every child of God, every believer, those that's been washed by the blood, uh, we must refuse uh, to associate ourselves with the world uh, in a way that will rob us uh, of our total commitment uh, and our total devotion to the Lord. You know, I thought about this, Brother Josh. Uh, there's a lot of good people who go to church. Uh, there's a lot of good people, uh, you know, that carry their Bibles. Uh, that would be wonderful Christians uh, that could really be something great for the kingdom of God uh, that could really do great things in the church uh, but they can't because they still love the world. Uh, listen there are folks uh, that have simply come to a stop uh, and cannot go any further uh, in their relationship with God uh, because they don't want to lay down the world uh, because they still love the things uh, of the world. But let me tell you something. Uh, we're either going forward uh, or we are going backwards. I don't know how you feel about about it, but I want to go on forward with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to leave it all behind. I want to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Him daily. Can somebody give Him praise tonight? Hallelujah to God. My, 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 my. There are folks that are stuck. There are folks that are good people. They go to church. They know the scriptures. But they can't go forward with God because they still have a love for the things of this world. Somebody said, well, you know, they may be worldly, but they still love the Lord. And they're still a Christian. Uh, the evangelist Billy Sunday. Anybody ever heard of Billy Sunday? From way back, many years ago, this is what Billy Sunday said in response to that. He said to talk about a worldly Christian makes about as much sense as to talk about a heavenly devil. To say I'm a worldly Christian makes about as much sense as saying that devil's a heavenly devil. 
I believe that there are a lot of people, amen, that we could categorize as worldly Christians. But the truth is, many of them have never been born again. They have never truly been saved. They've never had that supernatural birth and been changed by the power and the grace of God Almighty. They are simply spiritual tares. They know the routines. They know all the formations. But they still love that world. But let me tell you something. I, I still believe, Sister Sharon, I, if we ever taste of his goodness, I, if we ever get born again real good, I, we'll want to leave that world behind I, and we'll want to follow the King of kings I, and the Lord of all lords. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. When you see people who live like the world, who talk like the world, who act like the world, who dress like the world, who are comfortable with the things of the world according to the Bible. I said according to the word of God, these are people who have never truly met Jesus Christ and made him their Lord and their Savior. I know that people have to grow. I realize there's a, pro a process. I understand that. I, I'm just telling you when a person's born again, uh, there's going to be a change in their life. There's going to be a change in their loyalty. There's going to be a change in their devotion. There's going to be a change in their nature. There's going to be a change in their desires. Their appetites are going to change. Their attitude, their actions, their appearance is going to change. I'm telling you if Jesus comes in the devil's got to go out I said if Jesus comes in the wilderness has to go if somebody would fall in love with him they would lose their love for the things of this world somebody shout amen the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18 says, God said, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I told you before that the Bible is just as powerful in what it doesn't say as what it does. He said here to come out from that world, uh, from that system, uh, from that antichrist system, from that godless system uh, that is contrary and opposes uh, everything to do with God and his word uh, and holiness. Uh, and he said, come out from among them and be separate from that. Uh, and he said, I will receive you. That tells us here, he doesn't say it, but it tells us that if we don't come out from among that world, if we are not separated from that world, if we keep touching unclean things, he is not going to receive us. Jesus said he's going to come again and receive us unto himself, that where he is there we may be also. I'm just telling you according to the Bible, if we call ourselves Christians and we we don't come out from among the ways of that world uh, and that godless system. Uh, I'm telling you, we're going to be left here when Jesus comes. Uh, he's not going to receive us. Uh, I don't care how much you go to church, uh, how much you pray, uh, how much you quote scriptures. Uh, if we don't come out, uh, we're not going to be received uh, when the Lord comes again. You say, well, Brother Shelton, that's too hard. That's too sharp. You shouldn't say that. I didn't say it. He said it. God said it. It's God's holy word. If you see a bird that looks like a duck, waddles like a duck, quacks like a duck, associates with other ducks, I don't care what it calls itself. 
It can call itself a chicken. It can call itself an eagle. It can call itself a penguin or an ostrich. But I'm telling you, it is still a duck. I said it's still a duck. If it looks like a duck, acts like a duck, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, associates with other ducks, it can say whatever it wants. It is still a duck. And the same is true with Christians. We can call ourselves a Christian. We can say we love God. But if we love that world, the love of the Father is not in us. Hallelujah. When someone who's friends with this world and lives like this world and loves this world and is comfortable in this world, it may call itself a Christian. It may say it loves God. But James said that person is an adulterer and an adulteress and is at enmity with God. According to the Bible, that person is not born again. That person is not a Christian. You said, Brother Shelton, you ought not to judge. I don't have to. The Word of God's already judged it. Come on now. Amen. If the Word of God's condemned it, it is already condemned. People call themselves everything today. Every kind of thing calls itself a Christian. Oh, we love the Lord. God's really changed my life. Sitting there holding a beer in their hand. Got a cigarette lit up. Come on now. Ain't got enough clothes to go to bed on, but we love God with all of our heart. We're not part of that world out there. You make them mad, they'll cuss you out. They'll lie on their taxes. Oh, come on now, nod your head at me and smile at me here a little bit. I'm just telling you, just because it calls itself a Christian does not qualify it to be called a child of the Most High God. I'm telling you there's a problem with worldliness today. I said there's a problem with worldliness in this church age today. Matthew 6 and 24, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for he'll either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. According to the word of God, we cannot run with this world and walk with God at the same time. We are either for God or we are against God. We're either on the Lord's side or we're not. Listen, we can call ourselves anything, and a lot of church people do. I've never seen a time like this. I've never seen a time when the house of God has been desecrated the way that it has by people who call themselves Christians. They'll wear anything in the house of God anymore, or might I say the lack of anything in the house of God anymore. Come on, say amen. I, 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 listen, there, there's a church. I know the church. It's a Pentecostal church. I didn't come to hang out dirty laundry. I'm just telling you, if they're brave enough to do it, I'm brave enough to say something about it. They moved their pulpit out of the way. They moved their stuff off the platform. And they had a dance for their young people. And in that dance, they're playing secular music and letting their youth group dance around like they're in some kind of nightclub. I said, dear God, no wonder the Bible said judgment's going to begin first right in the house of God. I believe if we'll fall in love with the Lord again, we'll tear down the golden images. We'll tear down the golden calves and we'll lift Jesus up again and he'll draw me unto himself. Lord, somebody come on here to the Holy Spirit tonight. I feel him in this house here this evening. The problem is worldliness. There's a lot of people in our churches today who need to make up their heart and need to make up their mind who they're going to serve. Just once and for all. I mean, you know, this week they want to serve God. This Sunday they want to serve Him. This Sunday they want to be in church. Next Sunday they don't, they don't want to serve Him. Next Sunday they don't want to be in church. You know why? They still love that world. 
Oh, God, help me here just for a few minutes. I wasn't planning on this, but I'm already here. Already got the plows in the ground, so I might as well just go ahead and plow on a little bit longer. I'm just telling you, friend, this COVID-19 is not the problem with the church today. I said this COVID-19. Listen, I know that some people are afraid to come to church right now. I'm not faulting that. I'm not there throwing stones at that. There are some that have health issues, that have underlying health issues uh, that don't feel comfortable all right uh, but I'm just telling you there are some folks uh, that are using COVID-19 as a crutch uh, they're using that as an excuse uh, of why they can't go to church uh, listen to me uh, they can go to work every day uh, they can go sit in that restaurant uh, they can go in the bank uh, they'll go to Lowe's hardware uh, but they're afraid to go to the house of God uh, I'm telling you if I'm afraid to go anywhere uh, it's not going to be the house of the Lord I'm just telling you the problem is is that they love that word and they don't love God I'm going to have me a fit here tonight oh come on and nod your heads at me tonight and it's a problem across the board they say well I don't want to go it's not because of COVID-19. It's because they still have that love for that world in their heart. I'm telling you, you get this old time salvation. Amen. And the swine flu and COVID-19 and SARS combined can't keep you out of the house of God. Can't keep you off of service online. You're going to love the things of God Almighty. The problem is they don't love God. Oh, come on, help me a little bit. Oh, God, help me. I got to move on here. Sister Blanche, nod your head at me. They won't pay their tithes because they say, I'm not going to church. But they still paying that cell phone bill. Oh, Sister Lois, help me back here. I ain't got time to preach all this tonight. Oh, God, I feel good in my soul. Listen, they're going to see that cell phone bill is paid for. And they ain't going to dare let direct TV turn their service off. I don't care if there's a black plague that comes over this nation. And everybody's dying. They're going to see that bill gets paid, but they'll sit and rob God. You say, Brother Shelton, why would anybody want to rob God? They'll go days and won't read their Bible. They'll go days and won't pray. You say they were they Christians. No, no. Amen. I'm telling you, they're not even saved. A child of God is going to pray. A child of God's going to read the Bible. A child of God is going to want to do what the Word of the Lord says with a love in their heart for God. Hallelujah. If you're going to live worldly, you listen to me. If you're going to live worldly, if you're going to walk in the ways of this world, then you cannot belong to God, so stop acting like you do. How am I doing, Brother Scott? I said if you're going to live worldly, if you're going to act worldly, you're going to dress worldly, you're going to love the things of this world, stop calling yourself a Christian. Stop acting like you love God. Stop pretending. Stop hypocriting. Stop play acting. I'm telling you what's hurt the cause of Christ more than anything else are people who call themselves Christians, but they don't love the Lord. They love the things of the world. If you're going to serve the Lord, then you've got to leave the world behind. You've got to leave the sinful things of this world behind. If you're going to serve God, you've got to get out of Egypt. And you've got to get Egypt out of you. If you're going to live for the Lord, then you have to live a holy, consecrated, a, a righteous life under God and under God alone. We're blaming COVID-19. And what we really ought to say, a lot of folks ought to say, you know, I just love the world. It's not COVID-19. Let's keep them away from God. It's that heart that loves the things of the world. I ain't got time to chase worldly people. 
I don't have time to chase people that want to love the world. Listen to me. Until that person falls in love with God, you ain't never going to catch them. You're not ever going to get them to be faithful to the house of God, to the things of God, to the word of God. If they still have any love in their heart for this world, they're not going to be faithful to the Lord. The Lord's not looking for just a weekend lover. He's not just looking for some kind of some kind of part-time lover. He wants somebody that's going to be surrendered and sold out to him. You say, Brother Shelton, that preaching won't work in 2020 I'm telling you that preaching will still be the truth as long as time stands the Lord said if you're going to love me you cannot love the world hallelujah to God James did not mince any words here we try to make excuses for well they're trying they're not trying they're not trying well, they, you know, they just got to, you got to give them a little time. Well, you do. Uh, I'm telling you, friend, you can tell when it's a duck. James doesn't mince any words here. We need more preachers that will quit politicking and start preaching again. Have you got me on right here? I said we need more pastors uh, that will quit being so worried about politics uh, and positions uh, and get back to just preaching the word of the Lord again uh, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Woo! James was very plain. He puts it right down there where you can understand uh, exactly what he's saying. He said in verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Brother Baker, he didn't pull anybody behind closed doors uh, to preach that message to them. Uh, he just preached it to everybody. Uh, he preached it to that whole congregation. James talks about the sin of worldliness in the life of believers in a marriage relationship. Here he uses the figure of marriage. That young couple, they meet, they fall in love with one another. Isn't that a beautiful sight? To see a young couple fall in love. Ain't y'all precious. I like it because I'm like that. That young couple meets. They fall in love. They get engaged to be married. That wedding date comes and they're married. Oh, it's the most wonderful thing. This is the most wonderful happy day of my life. I finally met the girl of my dreams. She has changed my life. I mean, the, on, the only thing I care about is her. The only thing I want to do is please her. I want her to be happy. I, I'm going to go and eat where she wants to eat. Listen to me. <laughs> Listen to me. I used to hate Cracker Barrel. I mean, I detested Cracker. I don't know why. I didn't like their food. I, but my wife absolutely loved it. I mean, she could, she could smell a Cracker Barrel while we're traveling somewhere before you ever saw the sign. There's a Cracker Barrel coming up. I said, yeah, I know I can smell it. Oh, It's awful. I hate their food. I'm telling you, when we'd see that sign, she'd say, I want to go eat there. I might sit there and just kind of poke at mine and eat it, you know, not with a smile on my face. But I'm telling you, we ate at Cracker Barrel. And it wasn't long. I got to where I could smell it. I smell a Cracker Barrel coming up. I fell in love with that place. And, you know, we're working on the Mexican food deal. I eat it, but I don't like it. But I eat it because they like it. Amen. I'm telling you, that man meets that woman. She's the right one. She, he falls in love with her. They set that date. They're going to be married now. He's so happy. All he can think about is her. And that day, they're going to be joined as one. They get married. There's love and there's joy in that relationship. Things seem to be going wonderful for a while. But then the rumors begin to fly. Then the rumors begin to begin to spread around. There are rumors that he's become unfaithful to that new wife. And that he's now involved in some kind of illicit relationship with someone else. I'm telling you, when this happens, the sorrow and the heartache 
and the tragedy that always comes when one partner in a marriage is guilty of first carrying on flirtation then an adulterous relationship with some other person I'm telling you, it's always a tragedy. It always starts out with a little flirtation. It always starts out with a little look, a little long look. It always starts out that way, petty, before it turns into a full-blown affair. I'm telling you, friend, the same is true in the church. I don't know how it makes you feel, but it burdens my heart. It makes me full of sorrow and sadness. And I think of the tragedy when I think of the churches down through the years that I've known while I've been pastoring. Other churches and pastors who were conservative men, who were conservative churches. You didn't have to wonder what the standard was when you went in there. You didn't have to wonder was it a church or was it a honky tonk. They were conservative. They loved the Lord. But somewhere along the way, they began to flirt with that world out there. They began to flirt with the things of this world. And now, my friend, they have committed spiritual adultery on the God of glory. They become liberal. They become loose. And today they're worldly. And they've lost their power with God. It is a sad, tragic thing to watch a pastor or a preacher who's conservative it don't bother me too bad about those who've always been loose like that oh I could name some but I'm not going to they don't really bother me too bad because they've always been loose, whirly pastors brother it tears my heart out when I watch a conservative man get mixed up in something and they turn whirly and they lower the standard God's standard they start letting things go in that church they used to withstand against you ever notice that the conservatives never pull the liberals their way I won't walk with them. Oh, God. I'm not marching with them. I'm not going to meet for prayer with them. They're not going to lay their hands on me. Oh, come on, come on, saints of God. I know some churches don't like me because of that. Some pastors don't like me because of that. But I'm telling you there's a danger there. The Bible said how can two walk together except they be agreed. I'm just telling you I'm not going to sit down with some worldly pastor and open up and let tell him my burdens and things I'm dealing with and seek his counsel. I want somebody that's left this world behind that's sold out to the Lord of glory. I'm telling you a man like that can help you in the way I've never seen it when a conservative and a liberal start joining up it always works the same way that liberal always pulls that conservative his way that conservative man never pulls that liberal man his side I've watched it happen over and over and over I've talked to preachers about it. I've talked to pastors about it. That you better be careful. Who, who am I? I'm not on the state council. <laughs> I'm just an old preacher down here at South Ashboro Church of God. But I've told men you better be careful who you walk with. And you better be careful who you yoke up with and who you fellowship with. And I've watched some of them same preachers that used to be conservative men. Uh, now, my friend, they're no longer conservative men. Uh, now they've become worldly. They've lowered the standards. Uh, they have committed spiritual adultery. I said they committed spiritual adultery with God Almighty. Ain't too many people going to say anything about it. But listen to me. I'm not in this thing for a position. I'm not jockeying for a title. I'm not looking for a bigger church. I'm not trying to get on some kind of council here. Come on now. I'm not looking for anybody to elevate my name. Matter of fact, I, I want to be humbled before the Lord. I, I want to humble myself before Him. I, and know if there'll be any exalting going on. I, it'll not be because of who I buddied up with. I, but it'll be by the hand of God and the hand of God alone. 
own. Amen. G- James uses the figure of speech of adultery and unfaithfulness. And it applies to the Christian life and our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about spiritual worldliness and associates it with spiritual adultery. i got to hurry. The figure of spiritual adultery is used in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, Jehovah was pictured as the husband in Israel. is pictured as the bride of Jehovah. You know what happened to them? You know what God told them? God said, don't yoke up with those unbelievers. Don't mix yourself with them unbelievers. Amen. God, he warned them. He told them what would happen if they did. Did they listen to God? Absolutely not. Amen. Those people in the Old Testament, Old Testament Israel, they were unfaithful to the Lord. And the Lord describes their unfaithfulness in terms of spiritual adultery. He talks about them going whoring after other gods, having illicit relationship with other gods. They became mixed with the world and they lost their identity. I said they lost their identity. They were worldly and they were guilty of spiritual adultery with that world. There's a problem with worldliness today. When you come to the Lord, you are to put the Lord and I'm to put the Lord absolutely first in my life we're to sell out to him we're to surrender everything to him we are to serve him that's what God required of his people Israel he wanted Israel to put them first him first in their lives to leave that sinful world alone and to serve him and to him alone he wanted them to come out from among that world and when they did not do it in the Old Testament they were accused of spiritual adultery on God in the same speech is used in the New Testament The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 and 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. God said here of his church that we are engaged to one husband. He's talking about our relationship with the Lord. Listen, when we come to Jesus, we now belong to him. In a figure of speech, uh, we are now married to him. Uh, And because of this, uh, we are to turn our backs uh, on all other lovers. Uh, Everything that we loved before we met him, uh, now we're to leave it alone. Uh, We're to walk away from it. uh, And we are to serve him. Uh, Everything of this world that is sinful, uh, that is wicked, that is evil, uh, we are to leave it behind us. uh, And we are to follow the lover of our soul. Uh, We are to follow Jesus and be faithful unto him when we get saved we're to stop listening to worldly music we're to stop looking at worldly things sinful things there are folks that can't keep their eyes on the Lord who they're supposed to love because they got their eyes on the things of this world that they're not supposed to love I remember one time a, a girl It was on one of the ID channel shows. I've got to close here. Dear God, i got a lot more, but I'm going to you know, finish in a little while. And they talked about she's a, a beauty queen. She's so beautiful. She wanted to pose in Playboy. Isn't that something to aspire to? I want to pose naked. I ain't never want to do that. And if you have, God help you. That was her dream, was to get a call from that filthy Hugh Hefner, that pervert, eat up with lust, always had to have nasty women around her, no clothes on, the less the better. That's a lustful spirit. That's not of God. That girl was so, they said she's so beautiful. And buddy, she had dressed in a way because she wanted you to look at her. Let me tell you something. When the end of her life came as a young girl, 
She, she hardly wore anything when she'd go out. She wanted all eyes to be upon her. And I, I wonder how many marriages might have been broken up because of that. I wonder how many young minds got perverted because of that. He don't ever stop with just a look. I wonder how many, how many people were entrapped and enslaved because of how she dressed and how she flaunted her body. She wanted you to see what she was. I'm telling you, brother, brother Josh, when she died, amen, they found her body in a trash can and she had been burnt beyond recognition. All of that plastic surgery, all of that work to present this body as something to look at and something of beauty, it was all gone just like that I'm just telling you that's how sin is it may look lovely it may look alluring but the end of it is death I said the end of it is death so you better get your eyes and your mind off of it we stop listening to worldly music we stop watching worldly sinful things we stop going to worldly places. We don't get saved and go to the ballroom anymore. We stop dressing worldly. We put clothes on. Come on, nod your heads at me. I'm telling you, we get born again. What happened to those kind of salvation experiences? Wonder why the old timers had those kind of experiences and you don't see those kind of experiences anymore. I believe it's because a lot of people that say they're saved have not really been born again. Amen. We're to give ourselves totally and completely to Him. We're to live our lives in a manner that is completely pleasing to Jesus Christ. If you mess up, amen, out of love, you'll say, I'm sorry, you get it right. And you won't keep doing that thing that's not pleasing to God. Our attitudes are to be holy. Our attitudes, our appetites, our appearance are to be holy and pleasing to God, not unto me. And we are to live holy and not worldly lives. When we claim to be His, then we live a worldly life. We allow sinful things of this world to come between us and our relationship with God. We are unfaithful to Him. I said we're unfaithful to Him. And we are guilty of spiritual adultery. There are people. I'm closing right now. There are people who would never. Never commit adultery on their spouse. Ever. Never. I don't care who comes along. What comes along. Because they are simply in love with their with their husband or wife, and they would never commit adultery. But yet those same people call themselves Christians and they commit adultery on Christ. And it don't bother them. It don't faze them. There's a problem with the wordiness. It's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. We need some major bypass surgery spiritually in the house of God today among the church, don't we? We need God to do some open heart surgeries on us spiritually and fix those things that have clogged up our spiritual arteries, those things of this world that's clogged up our spiritual arteries. We sin against God, the one who loves us and the one who created us. It's a relationship problem. People have told me every kind of excuse of why, you know, I, well, I'm just not going to be there and I'm not going to be able to go to church and I'm not going to. You know, I'll be there when I can, but they're not faithful to church. They, they make excuses, but I, I know, you ain't got to tell me, I know what it is. It's a heart problem. It's a love issue. I, I don't get to pray every day because I'm just too tired. No, that's a, that's a lie. It's a relationship problem. I, I can't ever think of a day in my life since I've been married to Sister Amy for 31 years this year. I, I can't think of a time that I didn't want to that I'd go a whole day or two days or a week and not want to talk to her. If that's the case, there's something wrong in that relationship. I just don't want to be around you anymore. There's something wrong in that relationship. We saw a story I shared with them today. We, we'll close. You'll play softly. I'll bring it to a close in a minute. You want to talk about loving somebody. A man was married to a woman. 
She fell in love with somebody else. But he still loved her. She had the man that she was having an affair with. They planned on three or four different occasions to kill her husband. They were going to get him drunk, drive him up on a hill, put him in the passenger, the driver's side, run him off a cliff. The only reason it didn't work was because they didn't get him drunk enough. They tried a second time. Another, another ploy to plan to try to kill him. The last time they just took a, the, the, there were soldiers and the lover took a hand grenade, a live hand grenade, threw it into a bunker where he was and tried to blow him up. He lived. He survived. When they went to court, the lover got life. And when the wife was going to be tried, come here. They showed the picture of them walking the courtroom like this. And hand finger. That's how they were. That man who his wife tried to blow him up with a grenade was going to run him off a cliff two or three times, was going to try to kill him, and she hadn't was having an affair. She didn't love him anymore. She loved that other man. He walked hand in hand with her in court, got up on the stand and said, I, I want you to show leniency to her judge because I still love her. That's love. Yeah, that's great. Now, the Lord ain't never tried to do me nothing but good. If a man in the natural can love a woman like that and can be faithful to somebody like that, we don't have any excuse of why we're unfaithful to the God of glory who saved our souls from a devil's hell. Will you stand tonight? The Amplified said here of James 4 and 4, Ye are like unfaithful wives having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of God. You know why we can't have revival in the churches today? Because we're too worldly. We've got too many worldly lovers. I'm not preaching to sinners tonight. I'm preaching to people who are supposed to be Christians. Around this world, the reason we can't have revival in this nation and our churches is because we are too worldly. We're letting Ahab in the pulpit today. We're letting Jezebel lead the choir. We've lowered God's standards for the crowds. Now I'm telling you, we're paying a heavy price for it among much of this church age. I believe that the church needs to repent of her spiritual adultery. Fall back in love with the Lord again. I'm going to say this and we're going to pray and go home and I'm sure you're going to be glad. I'm telling you, before we ever go march in another abortion rally, before we ever go march up in town again. Before we ever meet at the courthouse again. Every pastor and every church member, every person a part of a church that calls themselves a Christian. We need to get back before God and fall on our face before God and make things right with Him again. And fall in love with Him again. Preachers need to get back to preaching in the pulpits. Oh, God help me. I never read where Jesus one time marched against Rome. I'm not faulting those who go out and march against these things. I'm just telling you, I never read where Jesus marched against the wickedness of Rome in that day. But I did read where he went preaching. Preaching the word. If preachers would get back in that time of preaching. Listen, march if you want to march. But if you'd spend as much time worried about what you're going to say to a congregation on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night as you are about going and marching somewhere, I'm telling you, we'd see a change in the church again. As that pulpit goes, for the most part, so goes that church. So goes that local church. 
if that pulpit's worthy, that local church is going to be worthy. I said, if that pulpit's worthy, that local church is going to be worthy for the most part. It's not always the case. Sometimes good preachers inherit worldly things. But the church needs to fall on her knees and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for loving that world. I'm not talking about people. We're talking about this system. The flow of this world that's opposed to everything to do with God and holiness. We had reached more people by falling our faces and repenting than we ever will marching up and down the streets. Sometimes so the newspaper can get a picture of us. We can have our little bit article in the paper and say what we think. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight. Lord, I preached your word tonight. I don't apologize for it. I'm thankful for the word of God. I pray, God, you would move in this church. You would move in our churches across the land, dear Lord. Father, I, I know that every church has some element of it in it. I know, dear God, that everybody sitting on church pews who say they love the Lord with all their heart, they really don't. I'm asking you to sweep through the houses of God again, dear Lord. I'm praying for revival again, dear Lord, that will cause us to leave our, every other love and, and return to our first love, dear God. In the church at Ephesus, they didn't lose it. They just walked away from it, dear God. I ask you, dear Lord, that you would touch this church again. Touch each and every one of us, Lord. If there's anything in our hearts and lives that's pining for our attention, that is ungodly, sinful, that is contrary to you or your word, I pray, dear God, we'd turn our back on it right now. We'd repent of it. We'd fall in love with you all over again. I pray for those watching online tonight, God, that are not able to be in church right now. Lord, I know there's some that do love you with all their heart. There's no question. But I also believe there's some, dear Lord, that have just used it as a reason to stay home, that simply don't love you with all that they are. I pray let them fall in love with you all over again. I, I believe if church folks would fall in love with you again, dear God, uh, we wouldn't see the worldliness on the platforms like we do today. Uh, we wouldn't see worldliness in positions like it is today. Uh, Lord, we want the sinner to come in. Uh, we want the ungodly, the unrighteous to come in. Uh, but Lord, we want there to be such an atmosphere of conviction uh, because the church is wholly in love with you uh, that the sinner can find God and be saved and be changed by the power of God I pray for pastors tonight who've lost their way who have fallen in love with themselves more than they love you who have fallen in love with their titles more than they love you who have fallen in love with positions and the applause of men more than they love you oh God Touch our hearts again, God. Smite our hearts again. I pray, dear Lord, that you would breathe your holy breath upon us. Drive out sin from our churches. Drive out worldliness among those who call themselves the redeemed. Help us, dear God, to make our path straight and to make wrongs right with you. I pray for those who just play church. I pray that you would save them, Lord. I pray for those who just hypocrite around, who are not sincere in their faith. I pray you'd convict them and squeeze their heart, dear God, and they would be born again. Come on, church, lift your hands to him tonight. The problem today, Brother Josh, is not COVID-19. That's not what's crippling our churches. That's not what's hurting our churches. Worldliness is what's crippling the church. Worldliness is what's destroying the church. I'm telling you, as that church goes, so goes that world out there. Brother Clendenin said, you can always trace it back to a preacher. You can always trace it back to that church. 
I believe if the church were to get wholly right with God, it would change some things in our community. It would change some things in our counties and our cities. Do I believe that this nation is going to turn wholly back to God? I don't believe that. I don't believe this nation as a whole is going to turn back to God. I, I believe in the end times we don't even read of this country. But I still believe there's hope for people in this country that want God and, and need God and will turn to God. I believe God will still save their souls. Do I believe every church that calls itself a church is going to get holy right with God? I don't believe that. But I believe that where the convicting spirit of the Lord is, I believe we're preachers. We'll begin to preach the word of God again. I, I believe somebody will get convicted. I, I believe somebody will get touched and realize I, I need to fall in love with the Lord. I need to get it right with God. If we keep pushing pablum from the pulpits, all we're ever going to have is babies on the pews. And until preachers and pastors are brave enough and fierce enough and fearless enough like James to stand up and call seeing what it is. We're going to see it. We're going to continue to see the golden images and the golden calves erected in the house of God while people just dance around and play with this world. Can you give God a hand of praise tonight? I'm not trying to be friends with anybody to get a recognition I'm not trying to be friends with anybody to get moved up I'd rather be an enemy of this whole world and be a friend of God than to be an enemy of God and stand against him as his enemy and to have the applause of this whole world come on now how many love God with all your heart soul mind body strength amen I, I'm telling you what would cause, we got to go home. What would cause an 87 year old young lady? 87. Granny, you 87, right? Aren't you 87, Granny? What would cause a lady at that age that's got health problems, in spite of what's going on around us? To still get up every service and come to the house of God. I'm telling you, there's a love down deep in that heart for God Almighty and the things of God. Now, I'm not trying to shame those that have health issues. I'm not trying to shame you. But I, I told Sister Shelton yesterday, I believe there's some folks that can, if you can go to the restaurant, you can go to work every day, you can go in Walmart and push a buggy around, you can wear a mask and come to church. It's a heart problem. It's a love issue. Oh, I've been preaching real good tonight. Sis Sharon, you ought to bring me another tomato for that one tonight. <laughs> God help us. You can't be holy and worldly at the same time. You're either for God or you're against God. We've got to go home. I love every one of you. Let me say this in closing. The latest trend now in churches, or so-called, the church used to be a place of reverence, a holy place. You wouldn't do things in the house of God you'd do in your own home. The latest thing now we assist Chester. We ain't going to do that around here. You ain't got to worry about that. But now they're turning our churches into workout centers. Because they can't go to the gym right now. So they meet in the church. God help us. They meet in the church in their workout uniforms. Men and women stretching in front of each other. Running in with each other. Now I know you ain't going to believe this, but I have a pair of jogging pants at home. You think all I wear is suits all the time, and I do most of the time. And I, had on a, I put on a pair of comfortable jogging pants the other night. I got in from church. I was tired. And I put a pair of jogging pants on and a t-shirt. And I, I made Sister Shelton laugh. I mean, I made her laugh hard. Every time I got up, I jogged. Where I was going, I said, I can't help it. It's these pants. They're jogging pants. You can't just walk in them. I finally said, I'm going upstairs taking these things off, put pajamas on, because you can sit still in those things. But they're showing up in the house of God. 
in their workout uniforms, their jogging suits, their shorty shorts, their tank tops, their leotard tops. And stretching and jumping and bouncing around in the house of God. Have you ever heard of such in your life in the house of God? Anything goes anymore. The house of God used to be a sacred, holy place. And I guarantee you, a lot of them that are doing that wasn't raised to do that. They, weren't, they were taught better than that going up. You reverence God, God's house. And you reverence the things of God. Let's don't be caught in adultery spiritually. Let's be faithful to the one who loves us with all of his heart. In return, let's love him with all of our heart. Can you give him a hand of praise? We're going home. God bless you for coming. I have wonderful news. We're going to be coming back here on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Brother Josh is going to be preaching. I know you've been praying for him. And we're excited. Let's invite people. Let's tell people about Jesus. This is a perfect time for the church. I, I Listen, if you have to do it with the mask on, tell somebody about Jesus. There are people that need help right now. What better time than to let them know that Jesus loves them. Jesus will save them from a devil's hell. Jesus can transform their life and help them and remove fear. And in the place of fear, put a perfect love. Can you say amen? Have a wonderful week. God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday night, the Lord willing.